sowing seeds, of course. And in fact, the Christian life begins with a seed. Peter talks about we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God that lives and abides forever. So we've already talked about the important, the principle of planning, trying to figure out if you're planting a garden, organizing a farm, or planning a life, what do you want to accomplish? And then what's it going to take to, to get there? Uh, last time, I was sick last week, but last uh, message on this was, was preparing. Uh, you have to prepare a farm, you have to plow the field, you have to clear the land, you have to uproot and remove the stones, the obstacles, you need to fertilize. We talked about that last time. And this morning we're going to focus on the actual planting of the seeds mm -hmm. um, in our lives. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about the planting of the seeds and obviously I didn't know you were going to talk about that because I have a short memory and I couldn't remember what you talked about <laughs> last time. Uh, but I mean I knew you, we were talking about how God sees us and specifically the vineyard and uh, planting and stuff but um, I just hadn't put two and two together but we had just just tonight we had a a guy's night and I knew we had to have a lesson and I the lesson that I had kind of planned was more discussion based but it was just this idea of what are you doing within your sphere of influence in other words that this person over here they have friends people that they know who I don't know we may have some mutual in our sphere of influence but they've got people that I don't know I've got people they don't know this person over here has people they don't know or that <laughs> that I don't know mm -hmm. all these different things we all have our sphere of influence and then we have to ask the question why does God sometimes bring people into our sphere of influence and uh, is there a purpose for it? Does God want us to talk to them? Uh, so I can't reach necessarily the people in your life who I don't know, but you can reach them. You can't reach the people in my life who do you don't know, but I can reach them. Uh, so it just it brought up this whole topic of God puts us in a particular place for a particular reason because He wants us to reach those people. And if you you think of a, a sower sowing seeds, well the the farmer or the person who owns the land will, may send out his employee to sow, but he'll say, you go over there, you go over there, you go over there. He's not sending them in different directions just because he wants them to overlap. Certainly there may be some overlap where they're spreading it, uh, but he says, I want you to go over there because there's, there's spots I want you to reach that this person can't reach. Uh, so kind of going back to your concept of planting the seed, God gives us the area that we're in. He brings people into our lives for a reason, and He wants us to plant those seeds. Absolutely, and that falls back on the whole planning process. In Jeremiah 29, like the farmer or the rancher, assigning mm -hmm. responsibilities for particular fields, for instance, or particular chores to certain so uh, servants. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's another picture that the Bible uses often, that we're His servants. And uh, but Jeremiah 29 says, God says, I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, thoughts or plans to, to bless you, to prosper you, to give you an expected end. God has plans, but unfortunately we do too. Yeah. God plants seeds into our lives, but unfortunately so does Satan and so does other. Uh, Bill Bright, uh, founder of Campus Crusade, wrote a track many years ago, uh, The Four Spiritual Laws, I think, and it opened up with, you know, God has a wonderful purpose for your life or a wonderful plan for your life. Well, the reality is we have wonderful plans for our lives too and others have plans for our lives. So like a, a farmer or, or a gardener, uh, we're, we're to plant in our own soil, in our own soul, but others are also mm -hmm. planting in our soul. And we also have the opportunity, privilege, responsibility, to be careful what we're leaving, what we're sowing in the lives of others. Mm -hmm. So are you, are you using the planting of seeds as an analogy of external reaching others, planting seeds in their heart, or are you using it as internal or both? Like, both. Okay, both. gotcha. Yeah, basically realize that we're not 100% responsible for everything that's planted in our soul because, you know, our education varies, other people speak to us, Mm -hmm. our media, our culture, certainly, uh, but we are 100% responsible for what we allow to stay there. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it is prudent to be discerning about filtering what comes in, what you allow mm -hmm. uh, to come in uh, to, to your soul, 
to your mind. Uh, COVID did many things, some good, some bad. But one of the things it really did is shed a light on the public education system as millions of school children were home and in some cases mom or dad or siblings were watching what they're learning and it was a real eye-opening experience to realize that in there, there's a, a a huge movement to indoctrinate young children in sexually inappropriate ways or ways that most parents would find completely inappropriate and those children especially preschool or kindergarten or first or second third grade they don't have the filters to you know they trust they trust the teacher knows what they're talking about so we it's very important because others are planting seeds in our life that we grow discerning mm -hmm. uh, so that we can uh, well, it's easier to clean the seed out before it takes root than it is to, to spend a whole season weeding out yeah. poisonous plants. And I can, I can think of various analogies on that which, with, within our own heart. If we think of our heart like a field, for example, uh, the field is limited in how much it can have. Uh, so you want to make sure you fill up the space with good rather than bad. And, uh, one analogy I can think of your neighbor who planted corn recently, or not recently, a long time ago, and it's still there, and every time I drive by, I'm like, ah, dead corn. <laughs> and I, maybe he knows something that I don't know, but I'm not a farmer, but it, it definitely looks like dead corn to me. Uh, and I know that that's been a very common thing. Maybe he just couldn't get around to it. Maybe he was busy. Um, but I, I frequently see that field as though it looks dead, and I think using the analogy of our own heart, sometimes a good thing takes root, sometimes it starts to grow, but we wait too long to, to reap from it, and as a result, and it ended up dying, and it was all for a way. So analogy one, don't wait for what has already been planted. Wait long enough until it's, ready to, it's ripe, but then don't wait until it's overripe. And then two, be careful what else you're planting in there, because you planted bad corn already. Uh, corn that you can't even eat. I don't even know why they have that corn. I guess decorations. Yeah, I didn't technically do that. My my son picked up some corn without paying attention, and the the corn that grew in my garden was the the decoration corn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's just this idea that you may look at your corn and be like, oh, look at this bounty that I've got that I can do nothing with, yeah. right? And there's a lot of good apparent good deeds, they look like they're good deeds, they look like they're something that's beneficial, uh, but in reality they're just distractions. Uh, so there's lots of distractions, the, lots of weeds, whether it's good or bad. If it's not what is God wants it to be, then it's just kind of taking up space. Certainly. I mean, uh, flowers are beautiful, and some people have gardens simply for flowers, and flowers have purpose, and pollinization, feeding the bees, etc., etc. But you can't eat flowers, and God is not against uh, in any way beautiful things in our lives, but if our lives are all for show and no fruit, remember one of, uh, one of the last acts Jesus did in the Passion Week was curse the fruitless fig tree. Mm -hmm. The tree had leaves, uh, but it didn't have any fruit. And of course, that was a sign of Israel because Israel was called in the Old Testament the fig tree, the Lord's planting, and it bore no fruit. It rejected Christ. But the principle is simply this. He cursed it because fig trees aren't for leaves. They're not made for leaves. They're, they're designed to produce figs. And Jesus simply said, let no figs grow on this from henceforth and forever. And within the next day, the tree was dead. Mm -hmm. But you made a very good point, and one I'm trying to emphasize in every one of the messages of this particular season or series. There is a season. Mm -hmm. There's a season to sow. The, the theme that we'll be looking at many scriptures as usual, but Galatians chapter 6, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Uh, but there's a season between sowing and reaping, and it's not a lazy season. We'll next week move on to protecting the crop that we're, we, we're planting. But uh, corn, for instance, depending on the time, I think it's 90, 93 days from the time you plant it. Uh, you wait from the time the corn, corn is ripe, and I'm not a farmer, and I may have the, the numbers, but you only have about a week. Mm -hmm. And the longer you wait to harvest it, the more starchy the corn, the sugars become starch. And the, and the worse they will taste. Mm -hmm. The farmer who plants around my 
my little mini farm. Uh, I'm assuming he's doing it for a reason. Maybe it's feed. Maybe he's going to grind it up. I don't really know that. Yeah. But I do absolutely agree. It looks like this season has passed. Yeah. And what you what he's not going to do is sell that corn at a farmer's market uh, because it has no value. Mm -hmm. The harvest. In fact, God uses uh, in Jeremiah. Jeremiah used the analogy: the 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 summer has ended, the harvest has passed, and we are not saved. Mm -hmm. And one thing I want to focus to everyone, as we're try as we're learning these principles, not just the principle of farming, but these biblical principles, we don't have forever mm -hmm. to implement them. If you miss the season of planting, you can't plant corn in November and expect it to, to grow. We have limited seasons for planting and an inevitable time where the harvest is going to come. And if we miss that harvest, uh, then we miss the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Of course, even Jesus said this, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is yet day, because soon the night comes when no man can work. Yeah, and today I, I went over to your house because I, I went to bring something for the, the grandkids. But as I was over there, I, I decided to eat a peach because I knew that they were probably ripe by now. But I wasn't the only one eating them. There were a bunch of June bugs there, too. And, <laughs> uh, I mean, just 20 June bugs on one peach, and I'm thinking... Uh, another good analogy could be talking about the idea of protecting the fruit. And that's where we're going next. All together worthy, all together wonderful to me. King of all days, all so highly. Exalted, glorious in heaven above. Humbly you came to the earth you created, all for love's sake became poor. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow. You're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Let's pray. Dear Lord, you are deserving of all the glory, all the honor. Lord, you are the only one worthy. Lord, I, I pray that though we've sung these songs many a times, that the meaning wouldn't fall from our hearts, and that we'd sing the, the words truly believing and truly glorifying you, Lord, in our hearts, but not just in our words, Lord, but also through our actions. Because worship is more than just a song, it's the way we live. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified in our actions and in our words and in our love. I pray that you would bless the uh, service today, Lord, and that you would open our hearts and soften our hearts, Lord, to receive the truth and to uh, act upon it, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Children can be dismissed for children's church. Turn with me in the book of Galatians in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 5 is where we'll begin. For much of this year, we've been focusing on a theme, and that's uh, 
trying to see our lives from God's perspective. Isaiah 55, however, one of those thirsty come to the waters, you have no money, come buy without money or without price. Why do you labor for that which doesn't satisfy? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy into our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heaven is high above the earth, so far are my ways above your ways. And, and simply said, God said, simply put, God says, you won't understand me unless I reveal myself to, to you. And that's what the Bible is about. God's revealing himself to us and re God's revealing ourselves to us. Some of the pictures are very flattering, some are not so much. And we've talked about many of them, a pearl, a great price, a treasure in a field, uh, that we are his sheep, the people of his, uh, people of his pasture. Uh, we are his, now, O oh Lord, thou art the father, we're the, you're the potter, we're the clay, you're our father, we're all the work of your hands. Many pictures. And if you read the Bible at all, and I certainly encourage you to do so, you'll find every book of the Bible has different ways to try to illustrate the nature of our relationship uh, to God. First Corinthians, we've been for the last number of weeks focusing on God and in the context of uh, a husband. John 15, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches, my father is the husbandman. And then talks about we're like a vineyard in which he's cultivating to try to produce fruit. First Corinthians chapter 3, you are we're laborers together with God. We are God's husbandry. A husbandry is a garden or a farm. In John 15, after talking about you're the vine, I'm the, uh, I'm the vine, you're the branches, you've got to abide in me and I in you because uh, without me you can do nothing. I have chosen you, in fact, to bring forth fruit. So we've been talking about principles, uh, uh, gardening principles or farming principles, if you will, but really principles on how to have a fruitful or productive life. John 10, in the context of Jesus talking about I'm the good shepherd, he says there's a thief out there that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and more abundant. So an abundant or a productive life, in a, for a quick review for those of you that it's been a while since I've picked up this series because of sickness or traveling, but productive lives like productive gardens or productive farms require some level of planning. Proverbs 29 says where there's no vision, no plan, the people perish. And of course, planning should be based on priority. Exodus 23, the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God. Commandment one, have no other gods before me. Matthew 16, where your treasure is, your heart's going to be also. It talks about, so why are you worried and preoccupied with what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, what you're going to do? God knows you have need of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. Colossians 1, 18 talks about he is before all things. By him all things exist, and God has ordained that in all things he should have the preeminence. So preparation, and preparation implies priority. Uh, I'm sorry, planning pro involves priority. If you don't plan your priorities, you're going to find things that really were important got substituted by things that just came up and urgent. And then last time we were together, we talked about practical preparation. Break up your fallow ground for it's time to seek the Lord. We talked about stages of preparation, and you can look at it like a farm or like a garden. There's the identification of the decision phase. What what's, do I want to grow there, and what's there now? Is what's there going to help or hinder what I want to accomplish? Luke 14, sees Jesus said, no man builds a tower and doesn't sit down first and consider whether he has the money to finish it. Or no man goes to war with 10,000 or 5,000 against an army of 10,000 unless he sits down first and figures out, can I, can I win this war? So likewise, whosoever he be of you who forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. And, and the word forsaketh doesn't mean throw everything away. It means arrange things in the right order. Apotasomai, arrange your life in the right order. So what's, what, what is already in my life? Is what's in my life, in my field, in my garden, is it important or does it have to go? Identification. Then the investigation part. And that means you plow, you, you rototill, you, things that you can't necessarily see. You have to dig deep and find out what's already growing there, what's underneath the soil. And uh, Psalm 139, David prays, God search me and know what's in my heart. And then there's the application phase. Once you've plowed, sometimes you kick up weeds and roots and rocks 
that, that you see after a while, but if you don't deal with them while they're exposed, they're just going to find their way sinking back into the soil of our hearts. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, talks about taking our thoughts captive and tear down the strongholds, the pre-existing prejudices and things in our life that we have built before. And then finally, the fertilization or the neutralization stage. You fertilize, you, you find out what are the plants I want to grow, need in order to grow, and are they already in the soil? If, and if not, I have to add them to the soil. And then this morning, we're going to move on to the, probably what most people expect, and that's what are we planting in our garden. Pick up reading with me in Galatians chapter 5. Verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We had a rather interesting and extended conversation in one of the Sunday school classes about this principle this morning. For the flesh, that's our natural tendencies, lusteth, the word is epithemeo, it means fiercely superimposes. The flesh, what I want, fights against the spirit, capital S, what God wants. And the Spirit, capital S, God's Holy Spirit, fights against the flesh. These are contrary one to another so that you cannot do the things that you would. You can't do wrong if you're a believer without conflict from God. And you can't do right, follow God's will, without some part of you wanting to go back and live for yourself. But if you be led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings. What it's saying, this is, this is the way a, gar a human garden will grow. Without God, without grace, without God's Holy Spirit, these are what's going to characterize a self-centered life, a life that is lived for self. And it's a pretty ugly list. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. Pick up reading with me down in chapter, seven, or chapter 6, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, plants, that shall he or she reap. He that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh leap, reap corruption. The Greek word in the New Testament means ruin, decay. He that sows to the Spirit shall reap life everlasting. In this context of purposeful planting, a couple of weeks ago we used this passage, Isaiah 5. I will sing a song of my well-beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He fenced it. He gathered out the stones thereof. In other words, he planned it. He prepared it. And he planted it. He planted it with the choicest vine, which means the most expensive, the most noble. The, the, I uh, don't know a whole lot about grapes. I've got a few of them. I'm not very good at growing grapes. They're a lot of work. Uh, but for those of you that are cattle people, this, this, this is a prize bowl. You know, he, he chose the best that he could. And he built a tower in the midst of it and made a wine press. If that's all you know about the passage, what do you think that the person who did all this work is expecting? A harvest. Why build a wine press if you don't expect grapes to grow? <laughs> then it goes on to say, what more could I have done for my vineyard than I have done, saith the Lord? Why then when I look for it to grow good grapes, did it grow bad grapes, wild grapes, inedible food? And then God says, for this I will do. I will tear down the hedge. I will let the animals in. I will, I will let it get trampled underground. And this is why, verse, verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. God is now using the vineyard to illustrate his relationship with his people in the Old Testament. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about grapes. I'm talking about a group of people, my people, Israel. And instead of looking for grapes, I look for judgment. And the word judgment, mishpath, in, in the Hebrew, it means justice. I look for right. I looked for right. I, I planted them. I protected them. I taught them my laws. I sent rain. I, I nurtured them. I sent prophets. I looked for fruit, the fruit of right judgment. But behold, oppression. And this is, this is kind of a play in the word. Justice is mispot. Oppression is mishpach. Sounds very similar. And sometimes people think they're giving justice when they're giving oppression. 
What happened this last week is a very good example of that. The advertisers about, about the uh, value them both, one word I kept finding in most of the billboards and most of the, freedom, liberty, liberty. Vote no for liberty. Who's liberty? The liberty to destroy another human being, apparently. Is that the way most people thought about it? No, they saw liberty. Who doesn't like liberty? It's like socialism. You go on college campuses, as Crowder has done, and you ask college-age kids, these are supposed to be the smart people. Are you for social? Oh, yes, socialism is wonderful. I'm a very social person. I want socialism. They don't even know what they're talking about. God looked at his people and said, I'm looking for justice, but what I'm getting is cruel slaughter. I'm looking for righteousness, and the word here is sedekah, virtue. And what I'm getting, another play on words, sedekah, I'm getting a shriek. You get the picture God is saying? I'm looking for right, I'm getting wrong. I'm looking for justice and mercy, I'm seeing oppression and innocent people crying out to me. So here's some, a couple of, just a few, brief principles for planting, what we're sowing in the soil of our soul. First of all, be intentional. It is absolute folly to plan and prepare and then expect healthy seed to plant itself. No one's going to come to your garden and plant healthy seed. Healthy seed is not natural. Only worldly weeds are natural. Have you ever plowed a field or plowed a garden and forgot to get, you got busy and didn't get around to it? Did the garden just stay in pretty plowed dirt for, for a long time? No. What happens? Seeds happen. If you aren't intentional about what gets planted in the soil of your soul, things will grow. That's the nature of this world. But it won't be healthy things. Mark chapter 4, 19, in the parable of the sower and the seed, the, the, the seed fell on soil that had already had been prepared at one point, but, but had been neglected, and therefore the thorns grew up, the weeds grew up. And when the seed fell there, there was no room for it, so the weeds choked it. First John 2, love not the world, neither the things in the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life is not from the Father, but of the world, and the world pass away. First John 5, 19, little children, we are of God. We know the whole world lies in wickedness, evil, and influence, disease, literally. So be intentional. Be informed. Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because they have what? Not, not that they were innocent or even ignorant. They have rejected knowledge. They didn't like truth. They rejected knowledge, so God says, so I will reject thee, that thou be no priest to me. God, in, in the Exodus chapter 19, when God got the children of Israel at the base of Mount Sinai, God revealed his plan. I want you to be a kingdom of priests. I want to bless the world through you. I want to use you, and I want to raise you up. I want to bless you, and I want to use you to tell the world about me. But they failed, and this is what he's talking about. You're not representing me accurately. Can that be said today of many people who claim to be people of God? They're not representing God very accurately. Saying you have forgotten the law of your God, I will forget thy children. Cause and effect. You sow, you reap. Be informed. The choice of seed, in other words, what you're planting in the soil of your soul should be based on the crop that you're anticipating, what you're looking for. Whatever a man sows, that, and of course man is generic, man, women, mankind, whatever a human being sows in his life, that he's going to reap. Jesus emphasized this in Matthew 7, the, par the, sower, I'm sorry, the Sermon on the Mount. He closes it with beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly the ravening wolves. Then he shifts the analogy. You'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns? Or figs of thistles. What is he saying? Thorns and thistles are weeds. If you want grapes or you want figs, do you plant thorns and thistles? It's, it's, this is a no-brainer. So every good tree brings forth good fruit, which means you have to plant good seed. Every corrupt tree, worthless plant, brings forth evil fruit. Where do the weeds come from? They come from seeds. What do the weeds produce? Weed seeds. So whatever you're sowing, 
it gets multiplied in your life. And the word evil is the same word that's used in 1 John 5, 17. The whole world lies in evil. Ponerous, it's hurtful. It's not helpful. Good means helpful, agathos, beneficial. Evil, it's hurtful. It, 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 the effect is hurtful. The influence is hurtful. It's literally diseased. So be intentional, be informed, and be aware or beware. And that's my message. Now for the conclusion. We're not the only ones planting seeds in the soil of our soul. So where do seeds come from? Where do garden seeds, where do farm, where do weeds come from? Well, many of them come from bird droppings. Birds eat fruit, or, and then we know what happens to the digestive system, and they plant it somewhere else. Matthew 13, 19, Jesus used birds disrupting the seed of God's word, and he said that the children of the wicked one, or they're the, they're the wicked one. Sometimes seeds can be carried great distances by winds or storms and deposit them where they weren't intended to be planted. It's interesting that Ephesians 2 describes Satan as the prince of the power of the air. Sometimes seeds can get blown over from adjoining fields. This sh shouldn't surprise us. I'm, I, I have a little farm-ish, um, dandelion farm, and a cat farm and chicken farm. Uh, and, but all around me, every side, across the street, to my north, to the south, to the east, to the west, are other farms planting other things. And it shouldn't surprise you, Linda, we, we put a little garden up, and uh, Linda was telling me this morning, my, and I don't know if John is right, but the grass, I mean, the roots are just incredibly deep, and, and we didn't plant the grass there, but somebody did. And John went back there for some reason. I don't know that John knows what he's talking about, but he said, Mom, that's wheat growing in your garden. We didn't plant wheat in our garden. Well, there's wheat around our garden. Uh, have you ever seen, uh, what is that, maize? I've never planted maize on my property, but and one, wait, maize is hard to pull up. Uh, and we'll see little pieces, uh, little uh, stalks of maize growing up on, on my property. And it shouldn't surprise us because what's in the next field can find its way into my field. What's my point here? First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, don't be unequally yoked together. Be careful who you're close to. And uh, 1 Corinthians 15 elaborates on this. Be not deceived, Paul is saying. And the word deceived is planoho. It means roam from safety, drift away from God. Don't be deceived. Whenever deception is involved, it's for one purpose, spiritually speaking, is to pull us away from God, pull us away from what we're supposed to be doing. Evil communications. Evil is the Greek, the Greek word kakos. It means worthless. It doesn't mean in, it, it, it's not ponderous. It's not necessarily disease. It just has no value. Not every weed is noxic. Not every weed is even ugly. But you can't eat weeds. They're worthless as far as sustaining life. Evil or worthless communications. And I love the King James Version of the Bible, but sometimes the, there's words that are archaic. They don't mean the same thing that they did 300, 400 years ago. The word communications to most people means what? What you're saying. That's not what this word means. It's homilia. It means companions. It's the people you're communicating with, not just what you're saying, but who you're saying it to. Evil companions, people who, are clo who you have allowed close to you, will corrupt, will infect. Good, this is the word, not agathos, it's krestos, useful, beneficial manners, habits. And we use this. Grandma taught you this, didn't she? Watch who you're running with because they're going to influence you. This is what God said thousands of years ago. The people that you let close to your life can set some of the seeds in their life, some of the values in their life, some of the habits in their life, some of the language in their life will find its way into the soil of your soul. Sometimes these seeds are in, sometimes they're in an unintentional. In other words, we didn't do it on purpose. Life happened. Sometimes it's intentional. Seeds are intentionally sowed. Second Timothy 3, uh, this know also in the last days perilous times will come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, disobedient, parent, blasphemers, unholy, unthankful, without natural affection, having a, a form of godliness but denying the power thereof goes on to say this, but evil men and deceivers shall work, wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 
lies are intentionally sown in lives. I don't want to get political, but this bill that is going to be forced through this week, people know it's not going to do what it's designed to do. It's, it, they say this is going to reduce inflation. Hundreds of economists have said, no, it's not. Borrowing money, flooding the market with free money is what creates inflation. When, when Joe Manchin, I understand, and Christian Cinema were manipulated, threatened, or bribed in order to pass it uh, to using reconciliation, I actually heard, uh, I think it was Joe Manchin, I want to be careful, but I, the, the newscaster said, Joe Manchin, when referring to all of these reports, saying that this is not going to reduce inflation, oh, they're lying. <laughs> but somebody's lying. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. In other words, sometimes people intentionally plant falsehood. If COVID did anything, and it did many things, it opened the eyes of a lot of parents to what their children are being taught. Parents are sitting at home and listening to things that they thought were maybe inappropriate for the children at the age in which they were eight, and they became very concerned. Some of you know about the, the situation in, in Florida where the, administra- the uh, legislation in Florida um, passed a law basically saying we are not going to allow our kindergarten through third graders to be taught gender whatever, confusion, and, uh, and, and homosexual principles. And immediately the media attacked them and the administration attacked them and don't say gay bill is what, the the word gay is not even in the bill. But what is in the bill is we don't believe a kindergartner should be confused about his gender. And that was overwhelmingly supported by the parents. It was overwhelmingly opposed by Disney in Florida. And if you want an interesting read, read what Disney's doing. Have you noticed the infiltration of the, the homosexual movement into cartoons and, and, and even the gender confusion into cartoons. There are people who are intentionally planting thoughts into the hearts and minds of our children and our adults. And, and it's intentional and it's having the intended effect. Thankfully, some, some seeds that are planted are good. Passage goes on to say, but from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for instruction, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be equipped. See, Paul said there's a lot of evil seeds floating around out there, but you already have a healthy garden because someone took the time to plant truth into your life. What is the best defense against falsehood? Truth. FBI agents and agents who uh, try to, are, are trained to, to spot counterfeit money don't, spe- don't study counterfeit money. They study actual money so that when they're, they're so familiar with the actual money that they're trained to recognize something that's not accurate. Seeds can come from birds they can come from winds and storms. They can come from fields that are close to us or lives that are close to us. And there are people out there intentionally planting false seeds with great effect, by the way. But thankfully, there are people who are planting truth. While we are not the only ones planting seeds in our soul, we are 100% responsible for what we allow to take root there. We're not always responsible. Someone said, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep him from making a nest in your head. It's like random thoughts. The Bible describes Satan using fiery darts to shoot at us and those crazy thoughts. Ever had a crazy thought? I will not share the crazy thoughts that pop into my crazy mind, but we all have those stupid, crazy, where'd that come from? We are not responsible for all the seeds that are floating in our society And we're not, to the same degree, responsible for what lands, but we are responsible for what we allow to grow. We may not recognize, like the parable of the wheat and the tare, we may not recognize how dangerous that seed is, right? Wheat and tares look very similar for a while. Remember the parable? Shall we pull up the tare? The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. 
But while he slept, the enemy came, my last point, and planted tares. And as it started to grow, the, 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 the wise farmer said, wait a minute, didn't we plant wheat? Didn't we plant good seed? Where, where'd these tares come from? Someone put them there. This is a parable about your mind and about my mind. Somebody put it there. Recognize the difference. And when we recognize that something is growing that isn't right, we, can, we are responsible for what we do with it. That's why we need to weed the soil of our soul. That's another message for another time. We, we, we shouldn't just take for granted that everything that we think is right. Not everything on Facebook is true. If you get your information from TikTok, I pity you. Just because it's out there, out there has a way of getting in here. And while we're not always responsible for what we see, we are somewhat responsible or what we hear or even what we learn. Right, young, impressionable minds are, are open and trusting to whatever their teachers or to some degree their parents say. But if your children ever come home and said something that floored you, we have never used profanity in my home. When I say never, I mean almost never. But when my children would come home, even as young children, to start using profanity, I know it didn't grow in my field. So who put it there? Answer that question. Somebody else. Their friends. The same is true of, of, of our values. But, so we need to, when we recognize that's not a healthy plant, the longer you allow a weed to grow, what happens to it and your ability to remove it? Let's take a tour of my dandelion farm. Point made. Or my poison ivy. I got a little crop of poison ivy too, by the way. Isn't it interesting? I have grapevines, and I saw I'm busy in mowing, and I see a little bit of poison ivy, and, and I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I'll get to that. I'm mowing. I'm busy. I don't have gloves. I don't want to go digging through poison ivy. Next time I notice it, it's growing in with my grapevine. When, when should I have dealt with the poison ivy? We need to learn to recognize wrong, evil, hurtful, diseased thinking. And the earlier we pull it up, the easier. When's the best time to pull up an oak tree? <laughs> when it's an acorn. <laughs> and in this area, beware. We are commanded, right? Some seeds are, are inevitable because we're in an evil world. We're in a world saturated with deception, which means the vast majority, all of us to some degree, but the vast majority of people to a large degree do not recognize the truth. If I have been taught a lie is the truth, what will my emotional and natural reaction be when I am exposed to the truth? I will reject it as the lie. John 3, this is the condemnation, light, Truth is coming to the world. But men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. We are commanded to be people who will scatter good, healthy seed. Every parent knows this principle, right? Who is responsible for the education of your children? Not Miss so-and-so or Mr. so-and-so. God help you if you think that way. You are. And if you're not careful, not everybody can homeschool their, their kids, but if you're not careful and pay attention to who's planting what in the soil of their soul, then you're going to, don't be surprised to find what your teenager's garden looks like. And you can sit back then and say, wait, where, where that came from, come from? It's come from the last 13 years of people, friends and other people dropping seeds into the soil of your, that tender heart. Matthew 28, Jesus said, go on the world, preach the gospel. Second Timothy chapter 2, thou therefore my son endure heart, uh, uh, be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The things that you heard of me, the seeds that I passed to you, Timothy, the same commit you to faithful men who will be able to do what? Plant seeds in their lives. Endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. That seed, plant those seeds. First Peter chapter 1 says, we're born again. We're not born again of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. We're born again by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So be intentional. Make the choice. 
what you're going to make room for in your life. Be informed. Don't. How many remember uh, Green Acres? I don't even know if Great Acres is on anymore, but I used to enjoy Green Acres. And Mr. Mr. Haney, was he the uh, general store? And uh, I forget the guy's name, the lawyer from New York, who want, the wannabe farmer. I remember one episode really clearly. He couldn't grow anything, so he went to Mr. Haney, and Mr. Haney sold him seed, which was apparently in the, in the movie, in the, in the show, of Poison Ivy Seeds. And it's growing like wild. I think it's Oliver. Oliver was standing in the middle of the field of poison ivy, no idea what it was. <laughs> be informed about what you're planting in the soil of your soul. And be aware, you're not the only one planting, but you are responsible for what you allow to grow. First Peter chapter 5, be sober, which means be serious. Be vigilant, which means be on guard, because your adversary, the devil... As a roaring lion, another picture, the Bible is filled with pictures, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist. Fight back. Resist is the Greek word antithema. It means to stand against. Antibiotic, for instance. Stand against what Satan is trying to sow or do in your life. But see, Satan, before he devours us, he, he distracts us. He pulls us away. Have you ever watched how lions hunt? When lions are hunting something, it may be a whole herd or a group, but, but who do they attack? They, don't, they never attack the strongest. They attack the weakest. They attack the laggard. They attack the wounded. Satan tries to get us away from the safety of the, of the herd, for lack of a better term, or the safety of our fellowship with God. And, and so he distracts and he detains us. Second Timothy chapter 2, Paul, I just quoted uh, verse 1 and 2. Take the seed that you've received let it grow in your life, put it in the lives of other people, and teach them to do the same. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life, so he can please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. So Paul is using an analogy, don't get tangled up in the weeds of this world. You're, you're a soldier, you have a job to do, you get too tangled up in, in, uh, with the enemy behind enemy lines, you're, you're not going to be effective at your job. But then the passage goes on, and that passage ends, is, ends with people getting caught in the snare of the devil. So Satan does seek to devour or destroy us or defeat us, but he doesn't do it all at once. He does it by distraction and by detaining us, just keeping us from doing what we're put here to do until it's too late. I have a confession to make. When I heard about this value them both, I went to a training, and I thought, this is a great idea, and I immediately bought 100 bumper stickers, 200 flyers. And though I've talked a lot about it, I completely forgot that I had a whole box of that stuff. Guess what I found it? When you passed out the flyers, I, ah, light bulb that had burned out, by the way. I had to replace it. Light bulb. And I pulled the box out. You know where that box of material is now? In the recycling bin. I've been kicking myself all week. I just got distracted. Now, am I blaming myself? No, I don't think God works like that. But the reality, can we not all associate with missing opportunities? Things that were important at one point, we were even excited about at one point, but life happens. We get completely distracted. And then by the time we realize what's going on, the, the opportunity is passed. That is what Satan does with our whole life. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever you plant, you will reap. If you plant to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap ruin or decay. If you sow to the Spirit, you will reap life everlasting. So a couple of quick principles. It's very simple, easy to remember. Anyone who's ever planted anything knows this. You will reap what you sow. You will reap what you sow. You sow good habits, you'll reap good habits. You sow bad habits, you'll reap bad habits. You sow good friends, you'll reap good friends. You sow evil friends, you'll reap evil friends. You reap what you sow. And by the way, you will also reap what you allow other people to sow into your life. The people you hang out with, the practices, the attitudes that they have, that doesn't mean we should be enemies of everybody we disagree with, but we should be strong and secure enough in ourselves so that we influence them, not allow them to influence us in negative ways. 
will also reap after we sow. Numbers 32, 23, Moses said, be sure your sin will find you out. You can't sow wild oats and expect wheat to grow. You never put it in the ground and it pops up the next day. In fact, months or even years, Chinese bamboo, you know, China, one form of Chinese bamboo takes five to six years before it even starts to grow. You completely forget it's down there, but it's down there developing a root system. And in the sixth or seventh year, it grows like 30 feet. Things that we have done that were bad and evil have, may have taken root. And if we don't thank God for grace, thank God that if we will acknowledge and confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But what has been planted in the soil of your soul will grow. And it will produce some kind of a harvest if you ignore it. Using my analogy, God can reveal things that sometimes we can go and dig up before it's too late. Sometimes we can just dig up and say, Phew, I dodged that bullet. You will always reap after you sow. And you will always reap more than you sow. That's a good principle when it comes to a wheat harvest. It's a bad principle when it comes to dandelions or poison ivy. Hosea 8, 7, they have sown to the wind and they will reap the whirlwind. Since we will reap what we sow, what should we do? If you acknowledge that principle, then how can we use the truths of those principles to have a more productive life? First of all, we need to be intentional about what we're allowing to be planted into our soul. Entertainment, media, information. Can we all acknowledge that it has taken a hard turn left? And I mean left to right politically, I mean morally. Morally. You would be hard pressed to find moral entertainment on, on the major networks. You can't listen to that music, the profanity, the immorality, without some of it seeping into your soul. Some of you know I have a really weird mind. I can't remember my children's names, but I can remember lyrics from songs from the 60s. It's a blessing. No, it's a curse. And every once in a while, uh, one of those songs just roll, and I'll start singing that song out loud, and I listen to the words I'm saying. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe I listen to that kind of music. And I think, that's not what I want, but it's in there. And so, now it's one thing for me to catch it, but the reality is it's in there, and sometimes it leaks its way out. Not just in the songs we sing, in the attitudes we have. We, although it's true, no one can go back and make a brand new start, my friend. Anyone can start from now and make a brand new end. We need to do some weeding where we've been careless. And it's just foolish, foolish, foolish to recognize the wrong of that music and keep listening to it and think it won't affect me. So be intentional. Proverbs 4.23 says keep. It's the Hebrew word that means guard. Your heart is precious. Guard your heart with all diligence. He's take it seriously. Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. The word issues, uh, tosa'at, it means the boundaries, the stop, go, the red lights, the, the bob wire, the razor wire, the electric fence. Out of your heart, you recognize what's right or wrong, but what if your heart has been corrupted? So you don't recognize what's right or wrong. I'm going to say it again, and I know not everybody agrees with me. The whole issue of abortion was pushed through legislatively because it would never have passed. Not le uh, judiciously. Judicially. It was, it, that was the plan. That was the ACO's youth plan, 1973. It would never pass in America. Why not? Because America was too moral to accept the, the killing of human beings. So they pushed it through legislatively. They did the same thing in Kansas. 14, 15 years ago, Kansas legislature limited abortion, but what did the Supreme Court of Kansas say? No, we can't have that. The people who voted the legislators voted legislators who, who approved, who, who put limitations on it. That was Kansas 12, 14 years ago. Kansas is not the same Kansas it was 12, 14 years ago, folks. What would never have passed a popular vote in any state, maybe California, New York, limited, what would never have passed 14 years ago, passed 
in the bread belt four or five days ago. What is that telling you? What is that telling you? We can't blame liberal judges anymore. We've been infected. I'm going to say it. You, ki you kill a baby hawk. You kill a baby eagle. You're penalized. Severely. I'm going to say it. It's going to upset some of you. A girl has a baby she doesn't want for whatever, and I've counseled to pregnant ladies. I'm not insensitive to the complexities, but the vast, vast, vast majorities of pregnancies, unwanted pregnancies, uh, abortions rather, are simply because I don't want it. I just don't want it. Inconvenient. I, I don't want to see, I don't want people to know I'm pregnant or I don't want to have to carry it or it's my life. The vast majority, that's the situation. I can wait up until nine months in Kansas. And I don't want to go through, I don't want to go through it. I'm going to say it. Do you know what dilation and extraction actually is? Or partial birth abortion? If you don't, you need to. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Why has that become legal now in America? We're not talking about a rape. We're not talking about incest. We're not talking about a, a horrible situation where a girl gets pregnant and she can go to any pharmacist and get a morning or a month after pill and destroy that infant, uh, that, that fetus. I think that's still wrong, but that's, that's a level of understanding that nine months, I changed my mind. They give birth to that baby. They pierce the back of his neck. They suck his brains out. Or they dilated and they took a hook and a razor and ripped the baby. Dilation and extraction. It's ugly. You say, you shouldn't talk about it in church. We should have been talking about this in church for a long time ago. How have we become that? That's how we became it. We stopped guarding our heart. We let other people's deceived value system cross-contaminate our own thoughts. So now a lot of Christian people say, it's not my business. Not my business. And what did God say? My people were destroyed for lack of knowledge, truth, because they've rejected knowledge. I will reject them. They won't be priests unto me. They're, not, they're no longer representing me accurately. Because they have rejected my law, I will reject their children. You say, I don't like that. I don't like it either. A lot of things God says I don't like. But the harvest, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Proverbs 4.8 gives us a wonderful filter so we can identify weeds in our hearts. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. The issue isn't whether I understand. The issue isn't the issue is what's right. Is it true? I don't like that. Well, Jesus said, you'll know the truth. The truth will set you free. But before the truth sets you free, it'll hit you in the face with all the lies you believed. And you have a choice. And the choice most people make is they redefine God's word. That's not what God made. Well, black and white. What part of thou shalt not do you not understand? But you don't understand. Telling the God who created you and designed every part of your body he doesn't understand you is ludicrous. What's true? What's honest? What's just right? What's pure? What's lovely? What's of good report? If there be any virtue and any praise, think on these things. Now, here's the point I'm making. The word think, log logizomai, it's where we get the word logic from. It means keep and take. Take and keep an inventory. What is God saying? There's a checklist in your mind. If, you're, if something's popping in your head or in your, you're, you're, you're thinking over something, if it doesn't pass that list, remove it from the inventory. Don't think about it. Application number two. Are you making wise, informed choices about what you're currently putting into your heart? The programs you're watching on TV, the movies you watch, 
the Facebook or the TikTok. I'm, not, I'm venturing into a netherworld for me where you're exposed to everybody's opinion and you don't even know most of those bodies. If you want to say anything about Hollywood and, and, and Walt Dis, uh, and Disney and so many others, they're creative. They're good at what they do. And how many times have we tolerated inappropriate sexual scenes or gross profanity because there was a good story? And while we're focusing on the good storyline, what's the devil focusing on? All the little seeds that is being dropped into the soil of our soul. Are you making wise decisions about what's being planted in your soul. In Isaiah 5, why does it say the Lord hedged about his garden? What's a hedge? What's a hedge for? Protect. Keep, protect, guard your heart. Are you doing that spiritually? 1 Timothy 4, verse 8, talks about the importance of guarding your heart from people who are going to deceive you. Matthew 6, the same. Relationally. God designed us to come together. We're body. We're creating God's image, right? Spirit, soul, body. That's the way God designed couples to come together. Spiritually, are we compatible? Soul, are we agreeable? And then body, are we attracted? How are we doing it today? Absolutely opposite. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, we mentioned earlier. Evil communications will corrupt good manners. It'll corrupt your life. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship hath Christ with Belial? What concord hath the temple of God with idols? You're the temple of God. How about physically? You want a verse that's going to knock you on the floor? 1 Corinthians 3, 7. Whosoever defiles the temple of God, him will God destroy. Because the temple of God is holy. Which temple you are? means I put poison in my body willfully, intentionally. Is it reasonable for me to expect God to bless it? And then practically. We talked about that word legitimize. Present yourselves a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. It's your legitimize, your reasonable, your rational response. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think soberly according as God has meant dealt every man to the measure of grace. And then finally, are you aware that while others may be planting seeds in your soul, you're responsible for what you allow to grow there. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that we may receive the things that we have done in our bodies, whether they be good or bad. What should that reality motivate us to do? Well, be more cautious about what we let in and deal with what's already in there. How, you know, the devil is a roaring lion. Where would you rather face a devil, a, a, a lion, on a field with a gun, high power scope, in the safety of a blind, or, a, a, or or in your living room? The sooner you recognize evil, and the and protect yourself from it, the easier it's going to be. Second Corinthians chapter five ten. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, all of us, that we may receive according to what we've done in our body. Right. So, reap. Knowing, therefore, verse 11, knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Because we thus, but the love of Christ constrains us, not the terror. Terror is there. We ought to fear the Lord. We ought to, we ought to take him seriously. But the love of Christ constrains us. Because we thus judge. He died for us. That we which live should not live for ourselves but live for him who loved us and died for us. And then the rest of the chapter says, so be reconciled to God because you are his ambassador. Let's pray. Three things I've asked you to do. Be intentional about what you let into the soil of your soul. Be informed. Don't swallow everything somebody puts in front of you. Be discerning. And then be aware that what you mentally absorb, just like what you physically absorb can poison you or can benefit you, what you mentally absorb can have the same effect. It can benefit you or it can poison you. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share these truths. These are not my truths, Lord. I tried to share them with as much clarity as time would allow. 
try to use practical examples, Lord, though perhaps offensive ones, and my point is not to offend, but to help us to recognize how desensitized we have become because of all the weeds of worldly thinking that has infiltrated our souls. Lord, you love us like we are. You died for our sins. But like every loving father, you love us too much to leave us where we are, knowing that many of these weeds will choke out the fruit that you so desperately want to see cultivated in our life, fruit that is designed to bless others as well as to bless you. Father, I pray that you would help us to become intentional about the choices that we make and the impact that they will have on our hearts. To become informed, Lord, filtering what we hear through the filter of what is true and just and lovely and honest and virtuous. And I pray that you would help us to be aware of the seeds, the philosophies, the values that are growing in the soil of our soul that are poisonous, noxious weeds with your grace and help to learn how to uproot them. And be aware, Lord, that what we leave in our garden and the, what we leave in our hearts, what we leave in our souls, however it got there, will reproduce and will not only affect us but others. We ask that you would guide us in this process. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise to worship.